We have we like with us the with other teams. Lisa Barnett and on the phone, Alan Smith, to talk to us about digital accessibility. Schools that have online education now, uh, people with 
three meters or um, other assistive technology can get degrees online independently, again, without having to rely on somebody. Um, mobile devices, so there's been a pretty big drop, just like the rest of us, in the use of desktops and laptops, and people with disabilities are moving towards the native functionality in their mobile devices. Um, so we're gonna demo that today, and um, it's just assistive technology on the go. You don't have to carry your laptop with you. Um, I was attending a conference not too long ago, and uh, mostly blind people at the conference, and they just use their iPhones to do everything, to check the bus schedules, to make, to look at the can and find out what's in the can, you know, and take a picture of the label, and phones are amazing assistive technology. So, I'm gonna do a, at the risk of messing up my so far stable audio-visual experience, I'm gonna show you um, what an inaccessible website is like for somebody with a disability. In this instance, um, a blind person. So this is what the um, New York Times homepage looked like. Let me get to it here. This is on YouTube. So it's reading this link, 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 link. That's the primary navigation. It just says link, link, link. It's terrible, right? How would you know what you're even clicking on? There's no way to know. And that's the New York Times, right? Luckily, they have fixed the site, and it's better now. This is from 2014, but um, it's, it's a horrible experience. And I know we're all, especially you guys, are in the business of making great user experiences, so you would not want that to fly. Okay. Put that out of my screen. I was in. Okay. So why are we doing this? I can't so first of all, it's the right thing to do. We have a commitment to our users and our prospects that we will create inclusive experiences and support as many people as possible and not have like a separate but equal experience for people with disabilities. So it is the right thing to do. And we, we um, have a wide range of ages also in our um, community, so we need to, in our youth community, so we need to make sure we can support everybody. In fact, it's just good business because Right now, 8,000 people every day turn 65 and are qualified to receive Medicare. So those are all potential customers of ours. About 20% of seniors have some kind of disability. Um, it's a pretty high uh, <coughs> so they're sizable and they're a growing market. We need to serve those, those people. By the way, did I mention that just even wearing bifocals is a disability or using a hearing aid? I mean, there's lots of small age-related disabilities that we can design better experiences for as part of what it's done. Also, it's the law. As a plan sponsor, we sell Medicare plans. We're required to meet Section 508, and Humana's policy is to go above and beyond that and also meet the WCAG 2.0 level A and double A standards, which I can talk a little bit more about. Um, but we're required to be accessible as part of our contract with Center for Medicaid and Medicare and Medicaid Services. So what happens if we're not accessible? Um, these logos here, and you'll see ours among them, uh, represent companies that are, are currently engaged in structured settlements with uh, legal firms because people accuse them or file lawsuits about of them not being accessible. Okay. So it's legal precedent, and we, we are um, subject to those exact um, same requirements, and we can have the same problems if we're not accessible. So I always like to show this slide because this says who, who benefits from accessibility, um, good accessible design. And we always think of people that are blind. But what about people that are just colorblind? Now, I don't know why it's like this, but one in 10 men have some degree of colorblindness. I think it explains a lot about how you guys sometimes choose your outfits. But uh, women don't, don't are, are affected by it so much. So how many of you up here can see the number in that? So cool. The few that can't, most of you can. But yeah, good. <laughs> you're, you're good. But a lot of people can't. So um, one of the problems we have at Humana is our corporate, corporate brand colors are pretty similar in saturation between the plum and the bright green. And it's hard for somebody who has color blindness to tell those apart. 
So especially if you're indicating something that's clickable, like a link, or something that you're organizing by category for using color alone is really um, dangerous for people with any kind of color blindness. We also are designing for people with hearing impairments. We don't talk about that much, but um, we do need to make sure that we get closed captions on all of our videos. And I have resources on how to do that. Um, and there's other reasons why it's good to do that as well. If you're in a library or a place where you just can't have speakers rolling, rolling um, or a loud space and you can't hear. Good to have captions for lots of reasons. Um, this young lady, you can see, you, you may not even notice her hearing aids. So again, people may be all around you with disabilities that you're not aware of because they are just, it's just part of how they live and, you know, she has a hearing aid. It's not just old people or deaf people. Um, also people with mobility issues. So not just people in wheelchairs. This guy just has like a football injury of some sort. And I think he might have trouble getting control of the lead on his computer because he doesn't have full use of his right hand. So some of these can be temporary injuries or permanent disabilities. And uh, finally, people with cognitive and neurological impairments such as seizure disorders, dyslexia, um, problems with short-term memory. A lot of our senior members have problems with short-term memory um, or even cognitive um, issues uh, like maybe English is your second language, or your uh, lower grade level reader, sometimes that can make it hard to comprehend um, content. So it also benefits all of us. So here's some examples of some universal design features that we've all taken advantage of. Um, curve cuts and ramps help anybody that's ever pushed a kid in a stroller. They're designed for people in wheelchairs, but you've ever seen a delivery guide from EPS, they use those as well. Um, pushing the door, pushing the button to open it up. I have a six-year-old, she just, she'll hit those buttons every time. She just loves to do it. And then I don't have to try to open it or if my hands are full. It's really helpful. And then finally, this um, closed captioning is great for if you're in a bar and you just want to catch up on your name, but the, you can't hear it because there's a lot of sound. So we've all used great um, universal design that is designed to support accessibility. Um, but everybody benefits from good design. So I've had a bunch of questions about this lately. How can you tell if something is accessible or not? Is there a logo you can put on there, or an icon, or somebody that will certify you as accessible? And I'm here to tell you that there, there are not any industry-recognized approvals of accessibility. Um, there are a couple of companies that will sell you something that I've analogized it to the uh, return over police car that you buy and you put on your license plate and you hope nobody will stop you. It's not really, you know, going to stop you from getting a ticket. So there's no easy accessibility certification. Um, also, that's partly because that can change over time. So you might have an accessible website and then a developer uploads an image and doesn't put an alt tag on it and boom, you're not accessible. Right? So there's no way to um, measure this and keep it constant. So it has to be monitored and maintained. It has to be part of your life cycle of your product. Um, and if you do need proof that something's accessible, occasionally we have a client who says, I, I, um, I only want this product if it's accessible, you can talk to me and we can arrange what's called a VPAT, which is a voluntary product that's just really tough with. It's a government, um, it's a government form that has to be filled out. But I'm telling you, if you, if you can avoid a VPAT, you should. Because they're expensive, they're time consuming, and you will be doing iterations of testing, fixing, and retesting for a long time before you get this. Um, it, isn't an, it isn't a certification that you are accessible, it's a statement of how accessible you are. So I've seen lots of dirty VPATs, which are just like airing all your dirty laundry. This is how bad our site really is. And that's, you don't want to send that on to your customer your prospect. So in order to get a clean VPAT, you got a lot of work to do. Best to do it up front and get it done before it's too hard to do it. So, so in Humana, we, we track accessibility a bunch of different ways. We have our own standards, but for compliance, we track against a couple of different sets that we support according to our um, policy. And that's Section 508, and there's actually two pieces of it, the um, dot two, two and then dot three one. This is more like general um, performance um, success metrics. And then also WCAG, which is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, um, part of the World Wide Web Consortium's standards. And AWA. So this is an example of a snapshot of just one of our properties um, and kind of where we 
are. We can see, you know, we don't beat the 508 ones so great, and there's reasons for that. We thought that the 508 was going to be changing about five years ago, and so we focused on WCAG 2 AA. That's what our standards are, and that's what a lot of our testing is. So now we've had to go back and put in more um, 508 things because it never has not been updated. But it, it is scheduled to be updated in about six months, most people think. <laughs> most people think 508 is going to go, it's, it's pretty outdated, and we're going to go to a more um, user focused WCAG standard. You can see we also measure it over time. So we've had a, a great uptick, thanks to my friends Alan and Nick largely, and a lot of people who've worked hard on this. Um, from the first quarter to the third quarter, we had a pretty good, significant uptick in accessibility metrics, uh, at least for, this is not overall, this is for one property. We track a bunch of different ones. So another way we can evaluate accessibility that's not as messy or time consuming as a full VPAT audit um, is, is our, our accessibility tester, Alan, has developed a proprietary protocol for a high level audit. So this doesn't catch everything, this doesn't tell you that you're accessible, but it's a great start. And you're gonna catch most of the low hanging fruit and the repeated patterns. So it's a 33 point checklist and um, this is a little excerpt from it. And at the ends of your tables, I printed out each of those 33 points on the, um, UA, on the uh, what do I call it, checklist. The one that has fewer of those circle icons on it is, is the one that Alan gave. And if you want the full one that has all the steps and all the tools and how you get everything, and by the way, this uses all um, pre-approved or free software. Full conflicts, mobile device, uh, built-in screen readers, and um, NVDA, which you can now get from the service catalog. I recommend everybody download it. I just did it the other day, it didn't hurt at all. Um, so this is his, uh, and, and we've gotten a lot of great feedback on it from developers, and even from our accessibility testing consulting firm that we use. Uh, and it's a great way to just make sure you're doing due diligence. So we've also got this kind of gorilla style of, of, of accessibility testing that I want to try out with this team in particular, since you guys are kind of a gorilla group. I think you might be, you have to give me feedback on how this works, but um, we can, you can use your native uh, mobile device uh, accessibility app called VoiceOver, and it has, a, these are some ones that we use regularly, a screen reader, a screen magnifier, and a color blindness contrast checker. So all these tools are available in your phone. So, you guys ready to try this? You want to give it a try? Get after your devices. Plug in earbuds if you've got them. Maybe with just one here. Um, and I'm just telling you right now, do not just turn on your screen reader. It'll make you crazy. It's it's <laughs> just wait and follow the directions. All right. Everybody ready? First of all, is there any questions before I dive into this? Anybody have any questions or concerns? No. Okay. So first, go to your settings. I've got the pictures up on here. If you want to work ahead, I've got these lighter gray ones. And by the way, I know that's a little, not good enough contrast, but it's not a, it's a disabled thing, so it's okay. Disabled buttons don't have to be accessible. So go to your settings. And go down to general. Good. Scroll down to accessibility. Now swipe all the way to the bottom and click this accessibility shortcut. Don't click, don't turn it on, just click that. I guess that's right. Or maybe you do need to click the on. Nope. Okay, now set up your shortcuts for some of the features. So these are the three I recommend. VoiceOver, color filters, and zoom. If you have an older operating system, it might say grayscale. And you can use grayscale instead of color filters. If you want to drive um, brand crazy, you can also do invert colors. That would be, that's a, that's a fun one too. Okay, and then return to the general settings with the accessibility link up at the top there. Okay. Now don't, it's going to be tempting, but don't turn the voiceover on yet. So you need to turn the feature on to set your um, speaking rate. People who use screen readers can hear them so much faster than we can. It's like a, I'm going to date myself into the Evelyn Wood speed reading. You know, people that can read super fast. People with um, 
hearing. People that use screen readers can hear so fast. So let's just let's just dip our toe in the water and set it. Um, click on that feature and then set it somewhere between the tortoise and the hare, kind of in the middle. It won't give you. A yeah. Oh, that's right. We're gonna do this, I, Alan. I'll go ahead. I got going on it. I can't. I can't see anybody anyway. I, I got visual impairment going on, so um, since you're there, but I just want to <laughs> make a mention of uh, the screen you have now shows you tapping once to select an item. And if you move your finger around or touch, it'll focus an item. When you are focused on something, you double tap it, and it'll activate it. And then if you need to scroll your screen up or down, left or right, you need to put three fingers on your screen and, and swipe up and down, left or right. So those are basically the only things you need to know about so far. Yeah. You can finish it from here, Alan. I think we can hear you pretty well, actually, now that things have quieted down. Yeah. Okay, good. All right. So what do we have next? So we want to slide the, uh, the uh, speech rate guy in the middle somewhere, closer to the turtle. Uh, as Lisa mentioned, people who are visually impaired can actually hear three to four times faster than your eyes. So we can imagine hearing 60 words a minute, they can hear 300 words a minute and understand it. Okay, so uh, we have set all these things up and now we just uh, did you want to, did you have us go back to anything or just triple tap the home button? So you push the home button down three times real fast. One, two, three. Well, before you, you do that, before, really before you triple yeah. tap your home button, I want to, just to avoid having to deal with navigation, let's just get, get yourself on your desktop, your um, screen, home screen, to your favorite weather app. I suggest just using the built-in one so that it's visible on screen, and then do the triple tap of your home button to turn on voiceover. There you go. And when you're ready, now you hold the button down three times fast. One, two, three. And then you want to tap on voiceover. Now, in general, if you run your finger over your screen, it'll say out loud what you're holding. And if you double click or double tap, it'll open it.
want to check out either a responsive website or a um, mobile app to see if it, how it reads to a screen reader user. And one of the things you'll find is that it is super time consuming to go through every single link. We can just look at a navigation bar and go, that's the thing I want. But a, a blind person has to go next, 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 and to listen to everything. So anything we can do to improve that experience, like putting a skip to main, you know, skip to main content link is helpful because once you've been on the site, you already know what all the navigation is. You don't need to keep hearing it every time you go to a new page. So we have a policy, an accessibility policy, and it's available on the Humana uh, homepage. And every footer is right here. And there's also a resources link just at the bottom. If you want to find out what our policy is or if anybody asks you what it is, it's right there. And it also talks a little bit about what we're doing um, to improve accessibility and what our commitment is. So there's sort of two levels of accessibility in Indiana. I'm in the digital side of things, um, and we conform to these two um, legislative of uh, the um, standards bodies, WCAG 2 and 508. But there's also a whole other level of enterprise, and this is designed to help people as part of the Americans with Disabilities Act, and they provide things in different languages, they provide sign language interpretation, large print, TTY phone, all kinds of things. Braille ID cards, so there's a whole other level that's like outside of what I normally do, which is web accessibility. Okay, so have you guys seen that? Do you know the Humana brand site? Are you guys familiar with that? So on the brand site, we have a link to our um, our accessibility standards, and I, I almost hate to send you there because we're getting ready to update them for 2017. Um, and we're going to add in some more support for responsive design. When those standards were built five years ago, they did not, like six years ago now, they didn't have responsive design as a primary um, requirement. Also, touch screen and mobile experiences are going to be better supported. And like I said, we're going to add back in some more support for Section 508. So look for that update coming soon. Um, but here's where that link is right now on the Humana Brand Standard site. Um, and it's really to ensure that our properties um, all meet our legal requirements and our to our users. So tools and resources. So how, how, do you, how do we do this? How are we going to help people make their sites accessible? I'm just one person. Nick's just one person. Alan's just one person. We do our best, but we need everybody to, to help out on this. So we've got some tools available. I have a new digital accessibility hatch page. Woohoo! Hopefully you guys are all on hatch, hatchers. Um, and you can do things like Ask an accessibility question if you have one, and I'll answer it. Give me, you know, a few hours, or email me if it's urgent. Um, you can request accessibility services too, or training. We have uh, lots of services we can offer, which I'll talk about in a minute. And you can also post comments and provide input. I do a little bit of blogging about accessibility, so you might post up some kind of comment on on my blog. And so we have access to the standards and guidelines. Um, a quick reference guide, which I also printed out for you guys there. It's more of a front end um, piece. Um, and terms and definitions, accessibility terms and definitions. I have those uh, up on our site. And some access to some free web based tools like a font size checker and a contrast checker, um, some bookmarklets, and then a code validation service, which is the W3C, which I think is that what we're using right now, Nick, W3C? Okay. We're, we're going to have an enterprise level tool implemented soon. It's in sort of a small release test right now, but um, more about that soon. So you can see here that people are asked, I, I, sometimes that, this is just a conversation between me and myself. If nobody asks me questions, I'll just like start asking myself questions like, how can I get a screen reader? You know? So help me out and ask some questions so I don't look like a moron always talking to myself. Um, how do closed captions work and why are they, are they required? So, and within them, I always provide access to um, tutorials and links to get more information. But also, you can see people um, in the US team are asking me to review things. That's, that's how I get um, pink to do some review work. So, we're doing our time here. Oh, pretty good. So, this is the quick reference guide. I think this is going to really resonate with this group because it's really for how users experience your website. So these are kind of the main categories of um, things you can uh, double check when I'm reviewing things. I use this as my either checklist. So, you know, headings and body copy. This is one of the main areas we have problems with 
because designers tend to pick headers based on what they look like, not how they are structured as part of the page. So we get an H1 header up there, and then the next one you want to be kind of small, so you go right to H4. Um, that creates problems for people with disabilities who are scanning pages like outlines. Uh, keyboard use, you just gotta let go of that hover. You just gotta let go of it. We can't support hover um, exclusively. Now you can include it as part of your um, design, but it has to be also accounted for for touch screen and keyboard use only. You can't, you, there's no information that should only be available on hover because people with vision disabilities do not use mics. This is useless to them. So some things like um, click here and more links are also extremely difficult. It sounds like click here, click here, click here, click here when you're hearing a screen reader. But that doesn't mean you have to change your visual design. Um, developers can put a piece of code attached to each link that says click here and then for more information about managing your diabetes, right? So they can add that code in. It doesn't have to display on the screen. But you have to specify what you want that to be and work with your front-end developer to make sure it gets done. So I know you guys are agile, so I took out all the process stuff, but I couldn't resist showing all the different places that accessibility can be integrated into a normal uh, workflow. So for planning, you know, making sure that you have access to and are aware of the standards and understand them is important. Um, and planning for accessibility reviews. Get me on your schedule. You know, I do weekly reviews of lots of different properties. Go, through, go 365 on that regularly to make sure that they're maintaining accessibility while they're building and developing. Um, and then identification of training needs. You want to do that during planning so you don't get in the middle of an implementation cycle and realize, oh, we don't know how to do this. So get that training ahead of time. Um, design checklist, which I gave you guys. It's also called the quick reference. Um, reviews, accessibility requirement communication. How do you tell your developers, you know, this is what I want the hip area to be, you know, not, not the small area, but the bigger area. Um, how do I communicate a tab order? Those are all things we can help with. These are services. Um, and then a high level audit checklist, which I provided a uh, printout of just that first part of it, but Alan can show I'm going to give you the version that shows all the alignment of the standards and also all the tools and all the steps, step by step, what you do. And then um, finally, we can do screen reader reviews also. And, but now you're empowered to do that as well. But we have, um, we can do those as well. It takes a little while to get used to them. So it is a lot cheaper to do this during planning, design, and implementation than it is when you get alarm bells going off because something didn't pass UAT. And you want to get it done as early as possible. And you can't bolt accessibility onto the end. It has to be built into the project requirements. So we're all responsible. Um, oversight is done by the Digital Center of Excellence UX um, team under Julie Irvin. But uh, you have some help. The hatch group I showed you, parenting guidelines, some checklists, and then um, me and Alan um, Nick, I think you're kind of incognito. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he works directly with most of the developers. Yeah. I'll be more available soon. Okay. Okay. That's good news, actually. I usually, when people ask me for any development questions, I have to go, you're right back to you, and then I contact him. Because I don't, I'm a designer by trade. I don't really know much about front end, but I'm learning. So we have a good amount of time for questions or comments, and I just want to like open up the floor. Anybody have anything that wants to do? You want to give me the mic? Yeah. yeah. Hang on. So uh, I maintain a lot of videos uh, internally, uh, probably over 2,000 for uh, much of the enterprise right now. So we're running into a little bit of a problem. Uh, they deprecated QuickTime, which allows subtitles. They are deprecating uh, Flash, which also allows me to create subtitles. Uh, there are new solutions which will allow it, but Windows 7 doesn't allow HTML5 streaming with subtitles. So we're in the donut hole. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How do we fix this? This is probably a, a larger Nick question. I don't want to get an easy answer, but I will tell you that I have instructions on my hatch page for using the YouTube player and the auto captioning that already happens in YouTube. Um, but Trust me, don't leave it as, it's horrible, it's embarrassing. Um, but if you go through it, you can use it as a bed for later going in and editing. And I have instructions for that. Um, if anybody's interested, I can show you. Do you have anything you want to add anything? Where are these videos living? Are they uh, 
internal or oh, do they use our rendering? Yeah. We believe they're actually on our uh, internal files and servers, uh, which okay. does allow us to do sidecar proper files with uh, subtitles. Uh, unfortunately, the player is where it's going to fall down because we can't use QuickTime, we can't use Flash Zoom, and uh, it's going to cause a bit of a problem until we go to Windows 10 because version 7 doesn't do streaming. Yeah, that's an interesting one. Uh, I can get back to you on that. Okay, get back to you. Okay. Yeah, I'll get back to you on that. Uh, for, for, external, for external videos and videos or anything, not to mention YouTube, but we know that some I would love to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> some of our partners, uh, for example, the Canada Military, they have uh, YouTube's block, they can't. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. so uh, we have to figure out solutions for that. Well, we can't stream to them. So we have solutions for that, too. We should probably like that. Yeah, absolutely. I will say that if you do find yourself unable to apply closed captions, you can certainly provide a downloadable transcript. It's not a legal um, fix, but it does show you that you try. <laughs> and it is, honestly, it's the best you can do sometimes. You know, we're just, we're just doing the best we can. And thanks for bringing that to our attention. Anybody else have questions? Yeah. Oh, you have your own Yeah, two Awesome. All right, cool. So you mentioned something about uh, enterprise accessibility tool and the software engineer and me was thinking the whole time, why don't we just have this automated so that we can run this as part of like every time anyone does a, a commit or anything like that, we can just be like boom, run through and check it. So is that what that enterprise tool is like gearing up to be, just like an automated check that we can run at will? There is an automated check that is part of the tool but it returns a ton of false positives. Mm -hmm. um, you have to still go through and look at everything. And it really, only 20% only of all accessibility violations are caught with automated testing. Uh, it really is evaluated at the user experience level. You know, you can have alt tags on every single image, you can have all your links be labeled with ARIA titles, and then somebody still may not be able to enroll in their insurance plan with a screen reader, for example. Because the text, like, you may have the alt tags, but they may be empty or garbage, is what we're getting. No, um, it's much more complicated than that, but that could be one example, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, yes. Um, I'm doing some, some research on this. Yeah, right now. Really I'm doing some, uh, some analysis of the tools, the video, uh, Visual Studio plugin called Web Accessibility Checker. Uh, this is along the, the speak created by Matt's Christians and integrated with Web Essential to Uh It uses uh, an open source library called Axcore. Um, that was that was actually developed by our previous accessibility partner, EQ. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm analyzing that. It's not a it doesn't check on build necessarily. Um, you can probably configure to do that. It's more of a you know, like to debug what's going on in the studio. Um, so it's more fun. If there's anybody that's really hot to be part of the um, pilot group for that test, that software. Um, reach out to me and we, I can enroll you. Um, there's also training on there, so you might be interested in trying it out. But it, it's also how we deliver the results of manual audits too. Um, and then as you as you retest and you fix them, it will increase your um, you, you close them out and then it'll increase your the metric for accessibility. Those are little percentages that I showed. Those are derived from this tool. Um, so it's helpful. I mean, it, it's. We need it to be usable for, for developers right now. You know, it's almost overwhelming. You do an audit and you get like 10,000 violations and most of them are useless. Um, well, not most of them, a lot of them are useless and you have to go through and sort of pull out the ones that are repetitive. Especially things like global renderings. You know, those, you don't have to get those repeated on every page because that's not your team that deals with those. But those are gonna be part of your audit audit because it does the whole page. So we have to extract a lot of stuff and it takes time. But we can get there. I also want to point out that the user research team, which is part of user experience, is beginning to test with um, disabled users. It's kind of a new expansion of our user research program. So um, we found a, a user who was willing to participate who only uses his mobile device. And so that's like a whole new world for us is to learn how people with, you know, with disabilities use technology and their own technologies, not necessarily the ones that we, we want them to use. You know, they might bring to the table a combination of screen readers and browsers that we haven't accounted for. So we, we are learning from that too. Uh, 
So I'm fronted web developer and I don't do any native app development at all. And I've always wondered what the difference is between accessibility for designing websites versus designing applications. Can you talk to me about that? Well, well, the rules are the same, but how they get applied is a little bit different. And it's also kind of more of an art than a science. Nick? Yeah, I have not done any data. The best way of doing that is honestly just, just uh, uh, checking with, with, uh, with voiceover and or uh, Android talkback through developing an Android OS. Um, you know, I'm sure there's, there's a bunch of, uh, Apple's actually really great with accessibility. They have a lot of resources online. Um, voiceover is just a killer screen reader. It's also available on Mac as well. But so I'm sure there's, there's resources on our Apple side for, for making sure it's really successful. So I encourage everybody to get um, NVDA, by the way. So now that it's free and available, you get your own mind. I don't even have to give you one. I borrowed it. <laughs> so for those of us who are responsible for our own user research, do you have any insights in how to work with Judas with testing and, and research with people with impairments? We're learning. Um, one of the big disadvantages of um, testing with somebody who is blind especially is you can't really show them a wireframe. You know, I mean, it has to be real coded content. Uh, and so like, you know, Axure makes junk code. You know, you can't test that with a screen reader. So if you're, you know, it's a, it's a challenge. To be honest, it is a challenge. And uh, I don't have all the answers for it. That's why we wanted to expand the research so we can kind of learn from it. Um, you can speak with blind users about, um, you know, the use of visual metaphors. Does this make sense to you? Does, do you understand the concept? I mean, if you're blind since birth, you, it may not even make sense use a visual metaphor, but if you acquire blindness later in life, it might. Those are some kinds of examples you can get mental model research done, but um, yeah, we can collaborate and figure something out. Yeah. Yeah, Keith, you wanna? I just don't wanna give this up. I don't know why, I feel like this is the power. I wanna follow up on the question about external monster. Oh. I wanna follow up on the question about apps. We have some quick new developers and our customers, right now, we're having discussion around just the charts and graphs. For example, there with the plumbing uh, and the green, and we're saying, this is internal, it's not external, but nonetheless, I think we have several hundred people in the market who use this. So we're saying, you know, we should pick colors that everybody will be approved. Uh, they're resisting that. Can you help us with the conversation that, that we perhaps should have with them? Yeah, sure. Well, you can also use other things like texture, like lines and dots in your graphs, too, besides just color. Um, and also, I mean, somebody that has color blindness may not even perceive themselves as being disabled, so they may not seek out a different version of the chart, but you can provide any chart data in a table, in a data table. It should be available in both modes. You should be able to navigate between them, like a toggle. Um, but I don't know if a colorblind person would would do that. They would just think this crap is crummy, um, you know. But putting space between the bars also is helpful. And also just directly labeling. You know, don't, a key isn't that helpful, but if you can directly label with a call out, um, it, that's the most helpful. Uh, if it's static, use an alternative text or a caption that describes what's happening. If it's dynamic, you really probably do need a representative in the table.
Any other questions or comments? Well, I really thank you guys all for coming, and I uh, hope the pizza was good. I'm going to take a slice back with me. But um, again, I'm Lisa Barnett, um, and I can be uh, emailed, and I'm also on Hatch, and Nick Bourgeois and Alan Smith are my partners, and um, we all want to help out however we can. We're really a resource. We're not the police, um, but we want to support any kind of efforts you guys can do to make things more accessible because the police are really outside this company. You know, they may come and find a problem. We don't do that. So I can help you. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Brian, for coming. Sorry I stepped on you too, Ellen. No problem. Bye. <laughs>